thanks. I'm delighted to see this uh, experiment working. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what this is about, and then Ara will tell you the details. Uh, the program I direct, CBA, is a cross-campus activity at MIT for people like me who never understood the difference between computer science and physical science, who work right at the boundary of hardware and software where you can't tell them apart. CBA was started with an ambitious NSF proposal where we said we wanted one of every tool of every size. And we got NSF on a good day, and they said yes. So we run a facility that from atoms up to buildings, we can make almost anything for the research. And then around that are many different disciplines working right at that interface. So physicists, chemists, biologists, lots of different disciplines of people anchored in the discipline, but with sort of a foot that doesn't fit in the discipline at this boundary. So molecular quantum computers on up. And one of the broad themes that's emerged from the research is the idea of digital fabrication. And what it doesn't mean is a computer controlling a machine. In 1952, MIT connected the first computer to a milling machine to make something. And since then, there's a lot of attention to things like 3D printers. But the real revolution coming in the research isn't a computer controlling a machine that happened in the 50s. It's actually putting codes and information into materials. So phones were analog. Claude Shannon wrote the best thesis at MIT, best master's thesis, setting up the idea of digital communication. Now we have the internet. And the key distinction is he showed that even though the phone can be unreliable, by communicating in symbols, you can find errors and fix them. So you can work perfectly even though the devices are imperfect. Then MIT had one of the last great analog computers made by Vannevar Bush. This was a room full of gears and pulleys. And the longer it ran, the worse the answer was. And so a bigger group of people digitized computing and showed you could compute reliably, even though the computer was unreliable, by computing with symbols. Um, manufacturing today is still analog. State-of-the-art airplanes, chips, the information is in the computer, not the material, so errors accumulate. If you think about a child building Lego bricks, the, the, the Lego is more accurate than the child because it corrects errors. And when you're done, you don't put it in the trash, you reuse it. And you don't need a ruler because the bricks have coordinates. There's information in the material. So that's not a new idea. It's four billion years old. It's how you're made. It's how the proteins in your body build you. There's a protein called the ribosome that builds with molecular Lego in exactly that same way. So the, the parts are more accurate than the things that assemble them because the material itself contains information. And so what all this is leading up to is about a 20-year research roadmap to the Star Trek replicator, quite, quite literally. And the recognition that that's a problem in putting codes and computing into material, embodying information in materials to let them turn into anything. So to get there, our research is going in stages from computers controlling machines to we're making machines that make machines, machines that can make their own parts, to building ways to assemble, um, you can think of it as engineering Lego, and at that stage, we're building nano-assemblers that snap proteins together. We're building micro-assemblers for electronics. Up to, we're building uh, assemblers to make jumbo jets out of giant carbon fiber pieces, but, but assembling discrete materials. And you can think of this as what comes after 3D printing. And then ultimately, we're working on programming the materials so that the, there is no machine. The materials themselves change shape. And to do that, again, we're doing that across length scales from proteins up to uh, buildings. And in the middle of that range then comes the work for today, which is robots. Today, to make a robot, it's a lot of work um, to make all the different parts of it. What we asked is, could we make robots that you could make as one continuous thing and have it change its shape, so shape-changing robots? And to do that, we had to do three things. We had to work out the mathematics of how you change shape. We had to work out a new way to actuate so that the robot can, can, can change its shape, can move. And we had to work out a new architecture for a robot that's essentially one long continuous piece and doesn't 
have the conventional separation in, into moving parts. So what R is going to present is a particular embodiment, this millimotin, but really you should view that as a, a embodiment of three different things, the math, the actuation, and the architecture. And this is a version using it. And in turn, it's part of this wider sweep in making shape-changing materials across many different length scales. Okay? So with that, I'll hand off to Ara. All right, so first of all, I'm delighted to be here, so thank you. Um, so we started this project, we were inspired, as Neil said, by this idea of programmable matter. And for me, what that meant was uh, that it's called the bag of stuff problem. In, uh, in the robotics literature, which means you have, a, you have a bag and it's full of modules, and you go and you reach into the bag and you pull something out, like you pull out a coffee cup or you pull out a wrench or something like that. You use it, when you're done with it, you put it back into the bag and it, the modules break apart and now, uh, or, or unfold the chain, and now you can make uh, your next object uh, you know, that you need, so there's no more trash, uh, very, very nice vision. So biology, as Neil says, provides us with the existence proof that this is possible. And I'm going to press my slide advancing button, and I'm just going to use my computer. Uh, so this is a video made by my colleague, Jonathan Backrack, and it shows a mechanical protein made of modules here folding into shape. So each one of those modules has a, a motor in it and the ability to exert a torque to, to make a shape. And you see it made a plus sign there, uh, folds back into a line, and then folds into the next shape. And so we were excited to make, make this, really make this uh, a reality. Uh, and we wanted to make it small, uh, in one part because the grant we had said that the modules had to be at least one, smaller than one cubic centimeter. It couldn't be any bigger than that. If it was bigger than that, it wouldn't, wouldn't really be uh, uh, you know, miniature enough. Uh, and so this was the, the state of the art at the time. And so you see the, the polybot here. These robots are much more capable than the one that we built, but they're also a lot, a lot bigger and more complicated and more expensive. Uh, so this is the polybot, which uh, can, can turn its joints here, and this can dock there. Uh, this is the MTRAN that can uh, uh, walk around. You can put the modules together and it'll walk around. Uh, this is a crystalline robot, slightly different. So these are sort of typical modular robots. Um, and then there's, because uh, we all, we want to make the small, we know that electronic components are usually much smaller than mechanical components. And so people have worked on, can you make a modular robot purely with electronics, uh, with just uh, electric and magnetic fields to, uh, to provide the motion? Uh, and so these are some examples of some systems that have electromagnets on them, roll over each other. Um, these cubes uh, pull toward each other with fluidic uh, forces uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and so inspired by this, uh, we wanted to design something, but we wanted to design something that was a chain. Uh, so this is just showing that electronic components are you know, typically smaller than mechanical components. So we wanted to design a chain made all of electronics that could fold itself uh, into arbitrary shapes, just like the video I showed. Uh, and so this is the, the machine uh, that we built. Uh, it's a chain of interlocked motor rotors and stators, uh, and then it has flex circuit wrapped around it for the electronics. It's, it's much simpler and has a much smaller number of components than an equivalent you know, four-joint robot. Um, power comes in along here, routes through, and comes out. Now, when we just started designing this, we said, we're not going to use any gears, because if we use gears, there's going to be tons of bearings in there and bearing balls and, and lots of teeth on the gears that can break off and stuff. So we said, no, no gears. It has to be direct drive. Well, we looked for a motor that would fit into this space here, which is about the size of a dime, and we couldn't find any off-the-shelf motors that would provide enough torque to actually be able to move these joints without burning themselves out. Uh, and so we invented a new kind of motor called an electropermanent motor. Uh, and I will, t yeah, I'll explain this. Uh, but before I tell you about that, let me tell you about the math of forming these shapes for a minute. Uh, so I told you before that we could fold arbitrary shapes using, uh, using this chain, and that's not a super intuitive concept. So let me, let me explain how that works. Let's say I have this dog, and I want to make, make this dog using my folding chain. Right? How do I make this dog? Uh, well, I, first of all, I, I make, it, make a pixelated representation of the dog. Uh, and then you can uh, make a, uh, a spanning tree here that 
uh, encompasses the whole dog. But if you were going to use a robot like this, it would need to be able to have T branches in it and stuff, and that would be complicated. But if you divide the, the uh, pixels up, so each pixel breaks up into four pixels here, then what you can do is you can just wrap one long continuous chain around it, and you can fill all the space of the dog. And now you can have, a, just like we were showing earlier, you can have a chain that folds up into a dog. Uh, so this is how this is the math behind this, and we uh, have proven that any any I mean, you can see sort of the basis of this here that any shape you can uh, including in three dimensions in any shape you can you can make it using just a, a, a chain uh, folded like this. And the nice th one of the nice things about this is that all this is is you, you as you advance along the chain you fold left or you fold right or you go straight, and those are the three steps. So those left, right, and straight are uh, if you like like the DNA code for the object. Uh, and then, and then you can fold uh, fold your mechanical protein into the shape based on that code. Um, so when we were uh, building this chain, as I said, we couldn't find any motors that would uh, that would do the job without burning out, with, unless there were gears. We didn't want to use gears, uh, so we invented a new kind of motor called the electropermanent stepper, uh, and that's based on uh, an electropermanent magnet, which is a type of magnet uh, used in uh, steel mills. Uh, and also in telephone switches, as it turns out, that doesn't require any power. It's, you can switch it on and off. So unlike, like an electromagnet, you can switch it on and off uh, with electricity. Uh, but like a permanent magnet, it doesn't require any power to stay on. It doesn't require any power to stay off. So it's a, it's a wonderful hybrid of an electromagnet and a permanent magnet. Uh, and I have a little, the, the basic concept of this is just that you have two pieces of magnetic material in here. One, it's very hard to change its magnetization, and one is very easy to change its magnetization. And so if they're magnetized opposite ways, then all the field stays inside, and there's no force down here. But if you apply a pulse of current, you can, you can change the magnetization of the weak material, and now they're magnetized the same way, and it picks up. And whether it's on or off, it doesn't take any power. So we built a motor around this. Uh, where we took these, each one of these legs of this arm here, each one of the legs of this object here are electropermanent magnets with a strong magnet and a weak magnet in parallel with a coil wrapped around them. And this is a motor called a wobble motor. So what happens is this center part here stays stationary, and these two legs will be attached. And then when it takes a step, these two legs will be attached, and it turns around. So I can show a video here of this motor turning on on, uh, on my desk here, we did some initial testing of this is an earlier version of the drive circuit. And you can see it uh, rotating around there. So we're excited by this. Um, and so then we went on to design the rest, the rest of the system around, around this motor. Uh, so we have our electronics. The electronics are very simple. There's power and data come in. There's a microprocessor, which is right here. There's some energy storage in these capacitors right here. Uh, there's some uh, power electronics to drive the motor, and that's it. Power and data goes out to go to the next module. So this is the circuit that wraps around each one of the modules. So we built a module, and I think this was about 2 o'clock in the morning, testing this on my desk in the handle of a pair of scissors. And uh, had to learn. we had to learn, the, myself and the other graduate students that worked on this had to learn watchmaking techniques to uh, put this together with tweezers under the microscope. Uh, a vendor we had been talking to about something told us this cool term, which is, he called, oh, how are you going to put that together? And we said, oh, we're going to use, he said, you should use GSWT technology to put that together. And we said, oh, cool, what's that? And he said, graduate student with tweezers. We said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we got this put together um, and, then, and then went ahead and uh, designed, uh, well, once we had that together, then we went through and did, did a lot of work to make it reliable and be able to put four of them together. So this is just showing how this is put together. There's that motor core in the middle. There's some uh, ball bearings on here, the case that goes around it. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And then the flex circuit wraps around and goes on to the next, next module. Um, so here's some, some results, shape reconfiguration results. So you can see we, we had this four unit module. And we have it here in a line. And then we can uh, send data in to tell each uh, one of these modules what angle to turn to. And if we just turn the last one here, we can configure it into this L shape. If we turn this one and this one, we can configure it into this periscope. Or if we turn all three of them, uh, we can turn it into a helix. So that the code is just left, right, or straight for each of these three. 
And with this four modules, we've made these objects. So I'll show you a video of that. Um, and this is there it goes. So power and data come in here, give it commands, folds into a shape, folds back. Now, when we were working with this, we did some uh, tests of the amount of torque that each one of these can hold. Because of course, one of the big questions we were trying to ask with this is, you know, is it possible to build a robot that can change shape, but without using gears, just having magnetic fields directly drive the axes? Uh, and we found that, yes, it is possible, but we were only able to get uh, a cantilever lifting strength of one, we call it, which means that if you hold this robot out in a chain, and you have this as the last module here, that we can lift one module up as a cantilever, but we can't lift two or three modules up as a cantilever. Now, the, the macroscopic geared systems I was showing earlier usually can lift two or three modules as a cantilever, not, not much more than that. And we think we can get it stronger in the future with lighter materials and, uh, and better, better magnetics. Uh, but, but here it is. It's working. And we think it's the smallest, uh, highest resolution uh, modular robot uh, ma yet made. Uh, and this is just a graph showing the, the torque results I was talking about. Uh, so we're really exciting. We're excited that uh, it seems like we have a uh, you know very low power count, scalable way uh, to build build these uh, shape changing chains. Uh, but graduate student with tweezers is is not going to do it. I, I really hope that's not the future. Um, and so what what is the future? Well, one one way to do it, uh, which is something that our lab is working on a lot right now, is an automated assembler uh, having a machine that can take lots of little little parts. Uh, you know, conceptually that are like Legos, uh, and put them together to form something like this. And you might, you might think of that machine forming the shape that you want, like forming your coffee cup or your wrench. Or you might think about, on a smaller scale, that machine being used to build things like this. Uh, and then the other thing you could think about is an integrated additive process. Uh, so meaning, uh, you know, current, current technologies for building micromechanical systems uh, you know, are not up to building something like this, but could we invent some better processes uh, that can deposit a greater variety of materials uh, so that you really could build something like this in one shot uh, with uh, MEMS technology, additive fabrication, that kind of thing. So those are the things that we're interested in now. Uh, and I'll also say that a as we went along doing this, something we found was that this uh, motor uh, was actually immediately interesting for commercial application. Uh, so a small, low power, uh, High torque motor. It turns out there's a lot of uh, aerospace and medical applications for that, and we're working with some industrial partners right now to try to commercialize this and get this get this out into the the real world. So, thank you very much.